Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Today we are going to be looking in a bit of detail at how charities can properly induct new responsible people who may, for example, they might have come on board after a recent annual general meeting. You might be having an annual general meeting in the in the next little bit uh, and expecting some new uh, RPs to, to come on board. Uh, we're going to be also looking at some of the key responsibilities that responsible people have, obviously um, going through some of the requirements uh, set out in uh, ACNC's Governance Standard 5. Um, now, my name's Chris Richards. I'm from the ACNC's education team. Joining me today is Jacob Wood from the ACNC's compliance team. Jacob, how are you? Hi, everyone. I'm excited to chat about inductions. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. All right, well, we won't hold up the excitement. I'll get through some very quick housekeeping points and we'll we'll launch on in. Um, as always, if you've got troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try having a listen through your phone. That means call the number listed in the email you'll have received when you signed up, uh, put in the access code and listen to the webinar that way. Um, we do have the ability to answer some questions asked uh, through the um, GoToWebinar sort of interface. You can ask a question at any time uh, through the webinar by typing them in. And we've got uh, Matt and Michael uh, with uh, busy fingers able to respond. We'll try to answer all the questions that come through. If your question isn't answered, please feel free to send us an email afterwards, uh, education at acnc.gov.au, and we will get back in touch with you. Uh, we're recording this webinar, as always, so the recording and the, uh, the presentation will be published on the ACNC website uh, pretty quickly. We will send out an email with website links featured in this webinar um, as a follow-up too, so don't worry about having to scribble a whole heap of website links down as we go. Um, links we mentioned today are included in the handout that's um, attached to the GoToWebinar interface as well. So you can refer to that too. Last thing we, as always, um, we value feedback. So any suggestions for ways that we can improve our webinars, please let us know via the survey at the end of proceedings. So there's the, there's the bits and pieces done. What we'll now do is we'll launch into things. Beautiful. Uh, what's on the agenda? We're going to start by explaining what a responsible person is, obviously, before detailing um, responsible people's obligations as part of ACNC Governance Standard 5. Now, Governance Standard 5, um, I guess, deals very specifically with what responsible people have to do uh, and the duties they have in their position uh, with, with a charity. We'll look at detail at how charities can ensure that new responsible people are, are welcomed they're feeling comfortable, they're, they know what they're responsible for. That, that obviously comes through good induction programs. Um, so we're going to examine what aims perhaps a good charity induction program should have, learning about four elements, uh, foundation stone, guidebook, launching pad and team builder, uh, as well as what an induction program should cover and also what existing skills and abilities responsible people might have that charities can I guess build on uh, through their in, through their induction program. So, what is a responsible person, Jacob? What is a responsible person? Thanks, Chris. Uh, simply put, a responsible person is someone who is responsible for the overall direction of the charity. Uh, so, what that means is someone who's on the governing board of a charity, uh, whether that might be uh, the board, the committee, trustees, board of director, we've all got different names, uh, but the person yeah. who sits on that governing body. Yeah. And now we've seen some charities and, and some, I guess, smaller charities in particular that include all their members as responsible people. Now, just a bit of a reminder here. Um, some might assume that if a member of a charity attends a board or a committee meeting, they're a responsible person. That's not the case. Uh, so in highlighting this, we're also underscoring the importance of, I guess, a charity having some clarity on what a responsible person is and, and isn't, um, and responsible people themselves having clarity that they are actually responsible people, if you get what I mean. That's a bit meta, but if you get what I mean. Um, so have some clarity on that and, and ensure that both the responsible people and the charity um, have clarity on that as well. Um, now, 
Jacob, uh, responsible people, they've got some, some duties and some responsibilities, haven't they? Yes, and that's why I guess it's important to know who the responsible people are. So responsible people have uh, duties and responsibilities that they have to fulfil as part of their role. Uh, those duties involve making sure that the charity is run properly and in line with the ACNC governance standards. Many of you will uh, be pretty familiar with the governance standards. Uh, as a recap, they are core minimum standards that deal with how a charity is run uh, and touches on things like processes, activities and relationships. Yeah, um, now obviously uh, there's, a, there's a link uh, on our website to the, to the governance standards. That's acnc.gov.au slash governance standards. So if you want to go and check that out, um, there are six of them. Um, and yeah, that, that, web, that web page will give you some more information on them. Um, generally speaking, the standards, they require a charity to remain charitable, um, to operate lawfully, and to be run in a way that's, that's accountable and responsible. Um, and they aim to, I guess, help maintain public trust and confidence in charities. Um, and they also aim to help, I guess, charities do their work properly uh, as well. Now, it's Governance Standard 5, as we've already sort of hit on, that um, is particularly relevant to today's session uh, because it spells out the duties that responsible people have when running a, when, when running a charity. Um, now, what does Governance Standard 5 cover? There are a number of things. First one here, uh, for responsible people to act with reasonable care and diligence. So that makes clear the expectation that responsible people know and, and stay updated on what is happening within their organisation, that they understand and stay informed about the charity's activities, their work, the finances, those sorts of things. This means that responsible people, you know, they attend meetings when required, they seek out more information or expertise uh, about things that they might not understand. One thing in particular, maybe, for example, finances. Um, you know, they, they endeavour to remain informed and make informed decisions that are in the best interests of a charity. Absolutely. And the second uh, duty that responsible people have when running a charity is to act honestly and fairly and in the best interests of the charity and for its charitable purposes. This means that responsible people must act honestly and fairly and place their charity first. So the interests of the charity really have to be paramount in decision making. Responsible people have a responsibility to put the interests of the charity above their own personal interests when they're acting in their role within the charity. Uh, we like to think of this as, I guess, putting a charity hat on when you're in that role within the charity. And finally, making sure uh, that uh, the charity continues to work towards its charitable purposes, uh, basically what it was set up to achieve or its mission. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and that bit about the charity hat, having a charity hat on is is very important. It's a good sort of, it's almost visual tool to to keep in mind uh, when you're serving as a as a responsible person. Um, the next little bit of governance standard five, the next next duty is that responsible people do not misuse their position or information they may have gained uh, in their role as a responsible person. Now, we mentioned charity hat again. You've got to have your charity hat on here. Um, responsible people mustn't, you know, for example, they, they, can't, they can't take information that they've maybe received in their role as a charity responsible person and then use it for personal gain, professional gain, um, others, personal or professional gain, or, or even misuse it in, in other ways that might be detrimental to the charity uh, it, itself. Um, the next standard is, is conflicts of interest. Now, conflicts of interest must be addressed. That means they have to be identified and they have to be properly disclosed. Um, and this, this is key. Um, a conflict of interest is where a person's own interest may be in conflict with the interests of the charity uh, where they serve as a responsible person. Um, 
Now, importantly, it's not for the responsible person themselves to judge whether something is actually a conflict of interest. We often talk about the reasonable person test or, or the independent observer test, as we've as we've written it here. Um, and generally speaking, if an independent observer looked at a situation and thought that maybe a responsible person's decision uh, or decisions uh, in their role as in the charity were being perhaps influenced by their personal interests or, or other interests, um, it might be an indication that they have a conflict of interest. Uh, now, importantly, too, it's important to remember here that even the perception that there is a conflict of interest needs to be managed and needs to be addressed. Hmm. So how do we how do we manage uh, those conflicts of interest? I guess uh, the first step is for the responsible person to identify any situation that uh, might be a conflict of interest, whether it is an actual conflict of interest uh, or a potential or perceived one, uh, and then put it on the record to ensure uh, transparency within the charity. Uh, to help with this, a conflict of interest uh, register is, is essential. Uh, that register is where conflicts are listed openly um, and it allows responsible people to uh, de declare conflicts and have open and honest conversations about them. Depending on uh, your specific charity's decision-making processes, a person with a conflict of interest may not be able to participate in any discussion leading up to the decision in addition to the actual decision-making process itself. Uh, fortunately, we've got uh, plenty of resources on the ACNC website about conflicts of interest and registers. Uh, there's a full guide to managing conflicts of interest at acnc.gov.au forward slash conflicts of interest uh, that you can take a look at. And in a previous webinar in March of this year, we actually covered off on conflicts of interest and related party transactions uh, in detail. And that's available on the website as well. Yeah, and, and look, that March, um, that March webinar really was a bit of a deep dive into the issue. Um, and any sort of questions or any um, issues or, or queries that your charity might have with that, that that's a, a pretty handy resource to have handy um, so that you can, access it and refer to it um, when when you need to. Um, now, the next duty that, that Governance Standard 5 sort of spells out is uh, that the responsible people need to ensure that the charity's financial affairs uh, are managed responsibly. Now, the minimum uh, for this, for example, is, is for responsible people to read financial statements to, and to have a process to ask questions if they don't understand elements of them. Now, we've touched on the idea of um, you know, responsibly uh, looking uh, at a charity's affairs. And that involves having a, a, a curious mind, looking at things with a, a critical eye, um, asking questions maybe if something uh, is, is unfamiliar um, or if a, a transaction or a process is something that they perhaps don't understand um, from a financial perspective or, or um, they're just, you look, they're, they're looking at it and thinking, hold on, what's what's this about? Um, ask the questions and, and that's an important thing. Uh, in addition, you know, responsible people should also know uh, or be familiar with the financial controls that a charity has. Um, and also if the charity's uh, anti-fraud measures um, and, and, and those sorts of things, uh, to be familiar with them, to know what they are, to know, uh, I guess, the processes that are involved there, uh, that's an important thing for responsible people to know as well. Mm. And the final duty covered in Governance Standard 5 is to not allow the charity to operate while insolvent. Uh, this one's pretty self-explanatory, but what it requires is that if a responsible person reasonably suspects that the charity uh, cannot pay all of its debts when they become due, uh, meaning that it's facing insolvency, then they should take all reasonable steps to prevent the charity from taking on more debt, and they should take steps to manage the situation. Uh, again, we have, a, we have a short guide to insolvency that can um, help identify the danger signs uh, and know the steps to take if you are facing insolvency. Definitely. Um, and that's at acnc.gov.au uh, forward slash insolvency. And, and that'll be one of the links that will be included in our follow-up email and also in the, in the handout that we, that we have here. 
Um, while we're on links and resources, there's a couple more there. Again, these will be included uh, in our follow-up as well, but just a very quick rundown. Um, handy rundown on the duties of responsible people with specific reference to Governance Standard 5 and a number of the things that we've just chatted about. There, there's the link there. We have a template letter of appointment for responsible people that outlines those duties. Um, and if you go to our, our templates and if you look for the template letter of appointment for responsible persons, that's uh, what we're referring to here. Final one, we've got a self-evaluation for charities available at that link there. It's a pretty useful reference point to help charities assess if they're meeting their obligations and also to identify any issues that might prevent them from, from doing so. Part five of this self-evaluation is really useful when it comes to looking at the duties of responsible people. And it can almost be used in, in some points as a bit of a basis for parts of a position description that your charity might want to develop or, or think of drafting out for responsible people. Or it can be also useful to just as a bit of a checkup or a refresher on what some of these duties are. So a number of uh, a number of resources there. Um, get onto the website and, and ensure that you're familiar with them and you can grab them if required. Absolutely. So we've spoken about Governance Standard 5, which should form a key component of your induction efforts within uh, the charity for responsible people. Of course, it's not the only requirement. So there's a lot more to a good induction uh, and welcome for new responsible people than just pointing out uh, the, the governance standards and pointing them in the general direction and saying you need to follow those rules. Uh, so Chris, <laughs> from a charity perspective, what function does an induction program serve and uh, what overarching aim should a good charity induction program have? Yeah. and and. Absolutely, yeah. Just pointing someone in the general direction of Governance Standard 5, as you said, Jacob, that's just not going to do the, the whole job. That's that's not right at all. Um, what, what we're going to do here is, as we go through this section is that we're, we're going to answer this, this question about, you know, um, as the previous slide said, the functions of a charity induction and, and the aims that a good charity induction should have. We're, we're going to look at, I guess, addressing this question by four you know, considering four different aims or perspectives. Um, now, being able to tick these perspectives off uh, and, and aims off, that'll most likely go a bit of a ways towards your charity's induction program hitting the target, as we can see by the visual here, uh, and doing a good job. Now, the first, I guess, way of hitting the target is to think about um, an induction and looking at it and seeing it as a vital foundation stone um, for responsible people. Something that forms a very reliable grounding foundation stone on which they can build their role as a responsible person, building on solid ground, um, a, a solid base. Mm. And in addition, in addition to that foundation stone inductions um, also provide a guidebook to the responsible person's ongoing role at the charity. So that includes the duties they have uh, and also the responsibilities um, they will assume. And when we say responsibilities, uh, they'll go beyond those uh, just mentioned in Governance Standard 5. Yeah. Induction. Inductions are a good uh, launching pad too. Uh, so your charity wants its responsible people to be on their feet, ready to launch and functioning well as quickly as possible in their role. So really looking to help them hit the ground running. Definitely. Um, and finally, inductions are, are, are team builders as well. Um, they should build a sense of team um, and a welcoming team uh, as well they should aim to increase uh, new responsible people's confidence um, and make them feel part of the group, um, be it a part of the group as the charity as a whole or as part of the board or, or committee. Um, so keep that one in mind as well. Um, so Foundation Stone, Guidebook, Launching Pad, Team Builder. Um, good induction program needs to take a bit from each of these aims or, or perspectives. So keeping these things in mind, these four aims or perspectives in mind, what specific features should be included in a charity's induction program? Um, Jacob, you wanna you wanna kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess 
kick off, it's worth uh, clarifying who's actually responsible uh, for ensuring that responsible people in, are inducted. Um, if your charity is in the position of being able to have uh, one person responsible for this, then that's uh, fantastic. I think for many charities that may not be the case and it might end up being a bit of a team effort uh, to induct new responsible people. That's definitely Chris, the case. I believe, um, oh, sorry, I was going to say. I believe we I'll might say, have had a question on this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we, we did, we, we have been asked just quickly to, um, I thought we'd, we'd perhaps jump in on this one, Jacob. Um, the idea of who's responsible, um, we've had someone mention the, the role of a board secretary uh, at this point in being responsible for induction. And, and look, I guess traditionally, if you can use the term traditionally, um, many organisations, be they charities, not for profits, even in the, in the business sector, um, the board secretary has often been the person who has perhaps formally been tasked with, you know, getting the induction rolling, uh, coordinating them perhaps for, for others to, to stage. Now, having this sort of central point of contact or, or coordinating point um, when it comes to inductions, it's, it's pretty important. But how that central coordinating point looks for each charity might be different. Now, um, some charities are simply not going to have a board secretary. Let's let's be honest here. Um, others might have someone else who might not be a board secretary, might just be someone else who, who does this job. As Jacob just mentioned, um, it might be a bit of a team effort, you know, and, and it's probably a more realistic, uh, I guess, situation for a number of charities out there. So don't get wedded, I guess, the first thing is don't get wedded to the idea that it has to be, say, a board secretary or someone in a specific position that looks after induction. Um, what is really important is that the charity has someone or, or someones, multiple people, who oversee this job and that there's a clear procedure uh, about how this induction takes place and what is included. So that's where the importance, I guess, really lies, that it's not necessarily perhaps just a board secretary. It can be a group of people. It can be one individual, but it's about the process and it's about clarity as well. Um, so, sorry, that's a, that's a bit of a diversion. We'll wander back onto the screen here. Um, now, the welcoming letter, Jacob, what's, what's, what's the go here? Yeah, so I guess the welcoming letter is a really good uh, starting point if you're looking to put together an, an induction program. Um, and really, it's it's just a, a kind of cover letter stating clearly that the recipient is a responsible person of the charity and welcoming, welcoming them aboard. Uh, and it might be something as simple as, thanks for joining the board of our charity, um, and then maybe detailing some of the necessary information, uh, such as contact details. Um, often, the welcome letter will uh, be a covering letter um, that provides an introduction to a bigger welcome pack and at helping your new uh, responsible person. Um, I will say traditionally, I've seen a lot of welcome packs be printed, but I think um, mm. uh, in, in the current climate, it's probably more likely to be electronic uh, or it's some kind of combination of their both, uh, of kind of uh, printed and electronic. Yeah, and, and we'll probably touch on that point again um, in, in the next couple of minutes that Obviously, with current circumstances here, having physical things may be a little bit more challenging. So, um, be flexible in some of these ways. If you've got material, you know, um, having electronic access to it might be might be uh, the better option, as you've probably already been doing with a number of uh, important charity bits and pieces over the last little while. Um, now, we're talking welcome welcome packs here. What what should they contain? So. First thing, probably, basic charity documents. Um, so it's, I guess, a copy of your charity's governing document, uh, or at least how to get access to it, because as we've just mentioned, it might be a digital copy. Um, now, the governing document is the constitution, rules, or, or trustee of, of your, of your organisation. Um, it spells out what your charity does, it spells out charitable purposes, it spells out your charity's official name, um, so that's important ad administrative detail. Um, 
key policies and procedures uh, uh, have to be part of a welcoming pack as well. Now, we've got some suggestions. I'll run through some suggestions. Obviously, each to their own in terms of uh, each individual charity being a bit different. So um, some suggestions might be, I guess, for a start, you know, HR type policies, personnel policies, um, if there's behavioural policies or, or procedures, um, they're, they're worth putting in. Conflict of interest policy, we emphasise that one. That's probably well worth putting in as a, as a key policy or procedure. Um, a link to your charity's interests register would be well worth uh, putting in as well. Both of these are important. Any um, policies in relation to, re <laughs> I always have fun saying this, remuneration or reimbursement. Um, so there's a bit of clarity there, so people know uh, what to expect and the processes that are in place there. Information about your charity's regular meetings, um, meetings uh, that the new responsible person will be expected to attend. Uh, where, when are they held? Where are they held? What are the processes um, uh, online? All of that sort of stuff. So um, there, that's just a starting point. Obviously, your charity might be a little bit different, might have some different points of emphasis that it wants to put forward. So um, each to their own on that one. Uh, now, information covering governance standard five should be in the welcome impact as well. Um, the duties and the responsibilities that we've already, I guess, gone through an outline today. What else do we? What else do we bung into the welcome impact, Jacob? Yeah, absolutely. So we can include what um, what we call important charity documents. Uh, so that might include incorporation documents, uh, strategic plans, uh, mission and vision statements, uh, financial documents. Uh, we'd usually recommend including the, the most recent financial report. Uh, and if you have one, the most recent annual report as well. Uh, it's important to, clue, to include what we call access information. So that is passwords and logins. Uh, and that might cover things like banking, uh, online banking, uh, technology and platform passwords. Uh, of course, the login to the ACNC charity portal. Um, when doing this, you've really got to consider whether access is appropriate for that responsible person. So. As an example, it, it might not be appropriate that every responsible person gets access to all accounts. Um, really, you want to limit it to, uh, I guess, responsible people who actually need the information or access to that account. Uh, and finally, uh, contact names and a number and numbers for people around the charity. Uh, basically, a contact list or a, or a who's who, um, and that might be names, contacts, uh, role within the charity. Uh, both for the responsible people and the, the other responsible persons, but also maybe the CEO account and some other key people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and beyond responsible people, that's that's definitely right. Uh, what, what else have we got? Yeah, I think uh, you could include instructions or step-by-step -step explanations on important charity tasks uh, relevant to that uh, responsible person. Uh, this will obviously be different for each charity, uh, but should almost be a bit of a guidebook on how uh, certain things are done. Uh, and also something we're thinking about uh, right now is uh, a list of some of the things your charity is currently doing uh, online remotely or, or virtually. So yeah. whether that's meetings, uh, virtual site visits, catch-ups, uh, inductions, um, basically the update on how your charity has adapted uh, to the last year and a bit um, so that uh, they're getting the current details on how your charity runs. Yeah, and, and that's, that's important because, I mean, obviously, there are a whole heap of charities and other organisations that have mm. changed the way that they do a lot of things um, by, by necessity um, and to ensure that when a new responsible person jumps on board, they're up to date with how these things are done is, is absolutely vital. Um, now, something here too that's, that's not on this slide that's probably worth mentioning um, is that it might be worth just mentioning as part of a, a bit of a welcoming pack, if there are any uh, other regulators or any other requirements that a responsible person might, you know, need to be aware of that might be in play. You know, for example, uh, fair trading bodies at state level that might cover things like fundraising um, or other regulators at perhaps a federal level, depending on the structure of your charity or the type of charity it is. So it doesn't have to be huge amounts of information at this stage, even if it's just a mention that, you know, there's there's other regulators in this space that that might have a little bit of a 
overseeing role of some elements of what you do as a charity. Um, now we've got information on the ACNC website too uh, under our other regulators page. If you go and have a look, that'll give a bit of a rundown, generally speaking, of a number of the other regulators that have a bit of influence in the in the charity space and, and that you may have to have, uh, I guess, some contact with or, or you may have some duties to fulfil uh, with. So just to give that a mention, just to ensure that, that your new responsible people are, are aware of it. Um, now, it's, it's probably a good idea um, to not muck around when you're distributing the welcome pack. Um, once someone comes on board, uh, they should get this information pretty quickly, timely manner. Uh, that way they can dive in, they can hit the ground running um, and they can you know, build on that base. They can be the, uh, the, the, the rocket and uh, coming off the launching pad. Um, once, your packs, once your charity's got this pack established, the other important thing is to keep it up to date. Um, things change, we, we know that. Um, key charity information, there might be policies, plans, passwords, logins. Now that's an important one, nothing worse than not knowing what a login is. Um, other important documents and information, these things change. So ensure that the changes and the updates are reflected in your induction or welcome impact. There's nothing worse than coming on board as a responsible person, getting provided with information and it's outdated or it's not correct. Um, that's not making someone feel part of the team and feel welcome. And it's such an easy thing to remedy as, as well. It's a poor reflection of charity as a whole too, if you don't keep this sort of thing up to date. And it can create a risk if, for example, an irresponsible person acts on outdated or incorrect information um, that your charity has provided. So we can't stress the importance of keeping this material uh, up to date. Um, and we can't stress the importance of ensuring that the Welcome Impact covers this type of material that we've just uh, covered here. That means it's sort of covered and gone through the four aims or perspectives that we've, we've talked about, um, that of Foundation Stone and, and Guidebook and Launching Pad and Team Builder. Excellent. Uh, so we've covered the welcome pack, um, but it's also important to, to arrange time for an in-person uh, meeting for new responsible people. Uh, of course, in-person welcomes might not be possible uh, in, in some parts of Australia right now. So if plan B means that these things are happening via virtual means, uh, then make sure that you're setting time aside for those virtual catch-ups. Um, normally, responsible people taking on a certain role on a board uh, might shadow someone already in that role as part of a, a handover process. Uh, that might mean kind of following them around for a day or half a day uh, to learn what the role entails and how certain tasks are undertaken and completed. Um, this gives new responsible people uh, a direct one-on-one -on -one kind of opportunity for guidance um, and also gives them a chance to ask questions and witness firsthand the duties and responsibilities that go with the role. Yeah, yeah. Now, if this process can't be done in person right now and in, in many parts at the moment it, it can't, um, there are other alternatives. Um, it can be taken online. Uh, there can be a bit of a virtual discussion there can be a, a virtual run through of, of roles or responsibilities, um, that, that type of thing. Um, now, and, and by the way too, when, when we're sort of uh, talking about this sort of thing, have a bit of a think and maybe consider uh, a bit of a online group sort of uh, catch up um, as a welcome as well. Now, we're probably a little bit over the whole online <laughs> meeting thing at the moment and it's quite understandable, but when they're used well, and when they're used in, uh, you know, for a useful purpose, um, they can be a great tool. So, you know, if, if that's the tool that you have to use, then do, do consider using it. Um, and obviously when situations change, we can catch up in person again, good opportunity to do that as well. So try and work it so it's perhaps the best of both worlds on, on that one. Um, now, in, in, your in-person welcomes also, uh, I guess they need to make sure that they emphasise points of contact, that they make clear to the new responsible person that there's 
contacts and points of contact and people that are available to help them with their duties and their responsibilities and that there's support there for them. The whole idea of being part of a team. Um, that might be you know, the person that they are directly shadowing or working with. Uh, it might be other people or it might be a combination of the above. Um, the, main, the, the main thing here, be it done in person or, or virtually, is to ensure that the knowledge that a new responsible person needs from a specific person or about a specific role is transferred across to them. That way, the roles and, and those specific responsibilities and expectations, they're all made clear early on. Um, the information and guidance about the specific role the responsible person will be performing uh, is all at hand and it's all ready to use and the responsible person has it. Absolutely. Uh, finally, it's worth noting that any specific information delivered through induction processes about a role in uh, a role a responsible person has with you um, should aim to build on any pre-existing skills and knowledge that that responsible person might have. Uh, some examples of, of pre-existing skills might include things like interpersonal and other skills. So, you know, if we think working cooperatively, being part of team efforts, um, being able to discuss and debate items at um, issues at meetings. Uh, the pre-existing skills might include comprehension skills uh, that help with informed decision making. So that's the ability to digest what might be a lot of information, whether it's, you know, written or verbal, um, and then actually make a decision based on that information. The skills might include uh, a basic awareness of risk management, uh, particularly around areas like financial personnel and occupational health and safety. Mm. And it might include working knowledge on how an organisation operates. So things like structures, responsibilities, um, as well as some of the legal or regulatory frameworks uh, that the charity operates within. Yeah, and, and again, those, those structures and frameworks may go beyond the ACNC as well. Um, as we mentioned earlier on, there may be other regulators or other uh, sort of uh, organisations in the space that, that you need to be aware of as well. So that's perhaps where uh, that sort of information um, gets built on, I suppose. We've got a combo here. Um, if you've got solid pre-existing skills and if they're backed by a decent amount of common sense and, and they're built on by a, a great induction, you should end up with a responsible person who's ready to contribute um, and contribute in a positive way to your charity and make a real difference. And as we've mentioned before, this, uh, the idea of a great induction, again, built around those four things, the foundation stone, the launching pad, the guidebook and, and the team builder. Um, that's pretty much the combo there, the equation and, and you know, the guy's getting thrown up in the air and, and everyone's happy and, and celebrating. So, um, look, a few tips to take away, um, just just quickly. Uh, we've got a couple here. The first one is that, as we emphasise, governance standard five really does need to be a, a key part of um, induction efforts that, that your charity has. Um, governance standard five is the key ACNC standard when it comes to outlining our expectations for the duties of responsible people. Um, its requirements need to be clearly spelled out to new responsible people as part of the process of welcoming, welcoming them on board. Um, also, be clear whose responsibility it is at your charity uh, to induct or welcome new responsible people. Uh, we mentioned board secretary. Again, we don't have to have that sort of formal sort of role uh, that's that's defined. Um, it can be someone who who uh, your charity knows uh, does it and is, is is able to do it. It might be more than one person. So uh, as long as it's clear who that person or people are, um, that's important. So be clear on that. Ensure that um, you're clear on who is responsible for the induction. Mm. A reminder on uh, what we described earlier as the four aims or perspectives for a charitable induction, sorry, for a successful induction program. Um, and that was the foundation stone should act as a guidebook, a launching pad and as a team builder. So keep those four things in mind and remember that a good induction program should aspire to aim for each. 
uh, importantly, uh, as we've mentioned, keep the information in your induction and welcome pack up to date. Uh, you can't properly induct new responsible people without information, uh, oh sorry, with information that's incorrect or past its use by date. Whoever's in charge of the induction, whether it be uh, one person or a team effort, uh, really keep tabs on any changes to the, the material within the induction program. And it might be something as simple as if a login changes, um, but it could also include things like updated policies or key information. Um, but the important thing is to keep the welcome pack and, and letter updated so that uh, new responsible people are kept updated. Yeah, definitely. Now we also, emphasize the, um, the, the, the in-person welcomes um, can often be an important part of the process as well. Um, now again, might be challenging to do this right now, given the circumstances. Charities should seek out alternatives if and when they're needed, virtual catch-ups uh, that might be held online, for example. Make sure they're relevant, make sure that they effectively convey any information that needs to be passed on from a specific person or about a specific role. Um, that's vital. Last one, remember the combo that we talked about just a couple of slides ago. Um, a responsible person's pre-existing skills and their common sense, when it's built on by a great induction process, that leads to that responsible person feeling included, feeling established and ready to contribute meaningfully and, and to make a real difference as well. So remember that combo. Um, now we, with 20 minutes to go, have, have reached some semblance of the end of our, our formal presentation here. Just a reminder that again, we're recording this webinar. So the slides, web links, uh, other information, they'll be up on the website. Uh, in the next day or two um, and there'll be links to all of this information in an email that we'll send out to those who, who have registered. Um, that will also contain other useful links to the ACNC site uh, and other bits and pieces. So um, please keep an eye out for that in your, in your email inboxes. We have gotten a couple of questions as we've proceeded today and also uh, had a couple asked um, before things uh, as well. One in particular was, and this is a common one as well, um, how do we as a charity get people to engage with finance reports and not just assume that the treasurer is responsible for everything? Now, that's an important one. This is a good question. It's quite a common issue too because look, Charity finances, like lots of finances, can be quite complex um, and they might involve some bits and pieces that you're not 100% sort of uh, assured of. So the simple answer here is that, um, you know, being engaged and asking questions and not assuming something is someone else's responsibility, this is an absolute key part of being a responsible person. So like, as we sort of said earlier, you know, curiosity, inquiring mind, those sorts of things, asking questions and not making assumptions, um, that ensures that the responsible people are doing the job outlined in Governance Standard 5. Um, now on a on a deeper level, financial reports, yeah, they, they can be seen as a bit daunting, uh, a bit specialist or, or dare I say it even sometimes a little bit boring. Um, the key then I guess becomes how a charity through its meetings and through its updates and through what it does uh, where financial reports are put forward ensures that there's ample opportunity for understanding and ample opportunity for people, responsible people to be included. Um, now, plain language explanation of concepts is, is one way. Um, wide open opportunities for responsible people to ask questions and, and not just in meetings here, um, but, but all the time. Um, and the, this is important, some responsible people, new ones jumping on board, even ones who might be a bit established, they might not feel all that confident sometimes asking questions, particularly if perhaps they have a feeling that the question might be perceived to be a, you know, quote unquote, dumb one. Um, and they don't wanna ask a dumb question in front of others or in a group setting, you know. Um, so make the finances engaging make the financial reports relatable and easy to understand and emphasise that, that questions are welcome and that what actually might seem to be a, a, a dumb question on the surface 
in fact, might not be a dumb question. It might be a very, very good question. Um, so it's it's a little bit in the, I guess, in the charities uh, court to ensure that, that the, the whole environment around financial reports isn't one where responsible people feel either uh, you know, overawed or feel like they can just push the responsibility to the treasurer because they're the financial expert, quote unquote. That's not how it should be done. Have an environment where um, where the, uh, the responsible person feels like they, they can ask questions, they can be involved, and that they, through explanations of concepts and that sort of thing, um, can, can understand uh, stuff. Um, it's important that charity makes things accessible and engaging. Um, and it's also important that in turn the charity and its responsible people um, ensure that new responsible people are also engaged uh, as well. So that's that's one, I guess, key question that, that we've received and we often receive it um, quite a bit about engaging non-financial specialists in the finances. Um, so it's a bit of both ways on that one. Um, I'm just having a bit of a, a gawk at the clock. What we might do, we might we might uh, give everyone a bit of an early mark <laughs> today. It's a, it's about quarter to put to uh, one o'clock here in uh, in Melbourne, but we'll we'll perhaps uh, give everyone a, an early mark today and allow you to go and have lunch or morning tea, depending on, on where you are. Um, thank you very much to everyone who has joined us today. Here's some of the ways on screen here that you can stay in touch with us. Um, obviously through the website, uh, social media, um, podcasts, um, through charity chat, um, that sort of thing. Um, we also have our charitable purpose um, e-monthly that um, goes out to charities as well. So keep an eye out for that. Thanks to everyone who's who's turned up today. Thanks for everyone who's tuned in and and um, and contributed. Um, thanks so much, Jacob, for joining us today. Thank you heaps. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> thanks, thanks heaps. Thanks to. Um, to Michael also and to Matt for answering questions in the background um, and thanks for sending those questions through everyone. We hope you enjoyed our presentation today and look we look forward to you again joining us in the in the near future. Have a great day and, and catch up soon.